Uh, welcome to our webinar, The Role of Social Determinants of Health in Promoting Health Equity. I'm Darling Jenkins, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. And this webinar is being presented by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council and the National Center for Medical Education, Development, and Research at Meharry Medical College. This is a 60-minute presentation. It is supported with the funds from her. Uh, Health Resource and Services Administration and the Bureau of Primary Health Care. This session is being recorded. Um, as I stated, this is a 60-minute presentation. We're going to divide it up into uh, different sections. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to reserve the last 15 minutes for uh, Q&A, but after the first presentation, we're going to have um, some questions, and then we'll uh, have some after the second presentation as well. There is a chat box below the presentation slides for your questions and any technical issues. Um, if you're having technical issues, please type that issue in the text box, as well as um, you may call our office at 615-226-2292. That's 615-226-2292 for any assistance. This presentation is, uh, again, being recorded, and it will be posted to the Council's website at nhchc.org within three business days. Uh, once again, welcome, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Katherine Brown. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Good morning. I'm Katherine Brown, and I serve as the Director of Communities of Practice for the National Center for Medical Education, Development, and Research. We are a HRSA-supported program. We are housed in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. We operate under the leadership of Dr. Patricia Matthews Juarez and Dr. Paul Juarez at Meharry Medical College. The aim of the center is to address the needs of three vulnerable populations, specifically persons who are LGBTQ, persons experiencing homelessness, and persons who are migrant farm workers. Our goal is to translate research findings into medical education curriculum and clinical practice into primary care training and practice guidelines. We have a diverse team of researchers at our center and three individual communities of practice to address the needs of each of our three vulnerable populations. Our community of practice includes working with national partners, the National Health Care for the Homeless Council. In collaboration with the National Health Care for the Homeless Council, the National Center for Medical Education Development and Research is excited to have you join us for the first of a quarterly webinar series that will feature content experts from our center as well as the National Health Care for the Homeless Council. Our focus is on clinical transformation and sustainability. Today's focus is social determinants of health and health equity. On November 5th, we will focus on cultural competence for vulnerable populations. On March 29th, we will focus on trauma-informed care. And on June 10th of 2019, harm reduction and substance use disorders. We look forward to working with you and engaging in ways that we can work collaboratively to transform medical education. My contact information is listed, and please visit our website or contact me directly with any questions regarding ways to be engaged with our communities of practice as we transform and engage persons who are experiencing homelessness and medical education. Our next speaker will be Dr. Darlene Jenkins. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, we're going to get started um, as we... Um, look at the role of social determinants in promoting health equity. Um, this is our, um, this project or presentation is supported by, um, as we mentioned before, HRSA, um, and this is the disclaimer for that. We are a national um, organization that has a cooperative agreement with um, HRSA to provide training and technical assistance to HRSA-supported health centers who um, provide services to individuals and families experiencing homelessness. 
Today, um, there's two of us from the council that will be presented. I, I'm Darlene Jenkins, and I'm the um, Senior Director of Programs. And then after I do my presentation, I'll turn it over to Dr. Barbara DiPietro, who is our Senior Director of Policy at the council. As we look at promoters for health equity, there's a lot of uh, different promoters for health e equity. We're going to focus on two today. Uh, one is the social determinants of health, and then the other is unconscious um, bias, also mentioned or referred to as implicit bias. So let's start with a definition. Just what is health equity? Even though the term is widely common, um, many may have um, just really a lack of true understanding of what health equity encompasses. Over time, the term has um, evolved, and there are similar connotations, but of course, there may be also different understandings of the meaning. So we're going to decide, um, or today, I'm going to use a, a real particular definition that is found, um, that was just, um, given by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation regarding health equity. And health equity means that everyone, and I insert it regardless of race, gender, expression, age, social economic status, class, or se sexual orientation, everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Uh, this requires move, removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and the lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environments, and health care. Um, for Healthy People 2020, they mentioned that health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. So it does require us valuing everyone equally. Now, of course, as we talk about equality, we kind of get stuck with that um, definition, um, health equity, health disparities, health inequities. Sometimes all these kind of get mixed up together, and it's important to understand that language does matter. Even though health equity and health disparities are many time, times used interchangeably, they're not the same. Um, health disparities and health equity are intimately related to each other, but health equity, let's remember that it is an ethical and human right principle and it motivates us to eliminate health disparities. And health disparities are the gaps or the differences in health status. And also um, when we're looking at health equity, we're looking at focusing on key determinants of health and we'll talk about the key determinants of health in a, a few minutes. But I just wanted to put down the definitions of not only health equity but health disparities as well as health inequities to ensure that we have a clear understanding of the difference as well as how they relate to one another. So as we look at equity and equality, equality is sameness. And I know you've probably seen this picture of the tree with people picking apples, looking at equality. Everyone on the um, left-hand side has equal access to the apple tree. Um, it's having sameness. And of course, this only works if everyone starts with the, at the same place. Whereas equity is fairness, where they have the access or the same opportunity. Again, the word is opportunity, as we used in the um, definition for health equity. And we must first um, ensure equity before even equality is enjoyed. You probably have also seen this diagram regarding equality and equity. And I think it just brings into um, a clear understanding is where you see in the first diagram, everyone has a bicycle, but um, again, equality is treating everyone the same, but equity is giving everyone what they need to be successful. So then that's when the second diagram is shown where everyone is giving what they need in order to be successful. That means moving or using the bicycle to to their best ability. As we uh, move forward, 
let's talk about what determines health. And I know you probably have seen this breakdown as far as how much uh, percentage is health behaviors add to a health. It's about 30 percent. Then health care is about 10 percent. But the social and economic factors that lend to health ranges to between 40 percent. And then the physical environment is about 10 percent. So that's social economic factors and physical environment makes up 50 percent of one's health. And then we look at genetics. And then we've seen graphs range between 10 to, to up to 30 percent. But we do know that health um, is simply um, is more than just having access to health care, and it starts way before one gets to the doctor's office or one um, accesses um, a health care provider. So many times we look at um, health and we say, okay, we're going to change health behaviors, but we very, um, but it's very important that we take into consideration the social, economic, and physical factors that make up one's health. And this is when we come into the whole definition of the social determinants of health. Addressing conditions of health or focusing on the role of social and economic factors that affect health is nothing new. In fact, in the fourth century BC, Hippocrates he recommended that physicians pay attention to environmental and societal and behavioral context of where illness occurs. And then in early, um, the early 20th century, the medical education reform, reformer Abraham Flexner, who is considered the father of the biomedical paradigm, exhorted physicians to consider conditions such as bad water supply, defective drainage, impure food, and unfavorable occupation surroundings in their work when they were caring for their patients. So we know looking at conditions that affect health, those social, economic, as well as physical conditions were a focus long before we started talking about health equity. So the conditions that we're referring to, the physical, the social, and the economical conditions are what we are terming as the social determinants of health. And here is a, um, a listing of the different categories of the social determinants. We know that these conditions are shaped by the amount of money, power, and resources that people have, and that these factors are related to health outcomes. So we, we consider health behaviors. Research has shown that health behaviors, you know, whether um, if a person smokes or if they drink or they um, have physical exercise, those health behaviors are good, indicator, are good indicators of um, what we say premature death. But when we really want to talk about health promotion, and cure as well as prevention, then we must look at the conditions where people live, where they work, where they play, as the social conditions um, or the social determinants of health when we're trying to really address illness and look for um, wellness and opportunities for people to be as healthy as possible. When we look at um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness, there are several different social determinants of health and health equity for those. We're looking at the neighborhood and built environment and health and health care, social and community um, context, especially, I should mention, social isolation as well as um, the, um, just the stigma of homelessness. Um, economic stability, extreme poverty. So there are specific um, social determinants of health equity for people who are homeless. And I know this is possibly probably um, very difficult for you to read, but you can access this document. It is one of our fact sheets on uh, the social determinants of health on our website. Um, and I'll give you that information at the end of this presentation. So let's think a little bit about our society. When we talk about people having the um, opportunity, you know, everyone having the same opportunity to be as healthy as possible, 
we need to consider that our society is structured like a ladder. So you have people that um, as you go up the ladder, and each rung is depending on um, the apples show resources. So the higher up on the ladder that you are um, placed or where you go based on education, based on job, based on um, 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 wages, um, housing, your savings, um, your neighborhood, depending on where you land on the ladder, you have more resources at your disposal. So the higher up on the rung, the more resources you have. Um, and then as you are lower on the um, ladder, less resources you have. You can go up the ladder or you can come down the ladder depending on different circumstances in your life. So a person may have a good paying job, they may be educated, but they may have um, an accident that causes them to be ill or have um, expensive medical um, bills. They may lose their job. They may lose a spouse. Um, I know in my case, um, when I went through a divorce, I was on a certain rung on the ladder, but then when the divorce occurred, I was a single parent of two. Um, one of my children had a chronic illness, and so um, when I found myself on a lower rung of the ladder, uh, with less resources, I had to make some very different choices in the decisions for my child's health care than I did when I was on a, a higher rung. And so as people are on the rung of the ladders and their resources, and, and, uh, their resources, resources determine their options. And many times the options that people or the decisions that people make are based on the resources and options that they have. And so when we look at the social determinants of health and health equity, that is why we have to really look at the different opportunities around addressing the conditions um, for um, ensuring that everyone has the resources they meet, need to make uh, the decisions for optimal health. And when we focus on social determinants of health, it's important that we understand that the conditions that actually contribute to health play a role um, that unless we, um, that cannot be ignored, I should say, cannot be ignored. So the question is why treat people and send them back to the conditions that make them sick in the first place? So again, we have to look at those conditions. And cure and prevention is the same motivation. So as we look upstream for prevention and then downstream for cure, social determinants of health play a role both upstream and downstream. And there must be a meeting of, of, of minds regarding the cure and the prevention of illness. And the same type of motivation that it takes to address cure as well as prevention, focusing on um, social determinants of health takes the same type of um, focus and energy to do that. As I come to an end, I just want to say that many times we look at health equity um, being the goal, which it is. It is an outcome, but it's also a process. So we start looking at identifying health disparities and social inequities and then looking how we can change and implement policies and laws and systems and environments and practices. And then we evaluate and monitor these measures and then reassess strategies to get to the health equity, to the fairness, to the opportunity where everyone has the same, um, I should say, to the health equity where everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. I'm going to pause right here and we're going to talk about, um, Barbara DiPietro is going to talk about the policies um, around social determinants of health. So, Barbara? Thanks, Darlene. Really appreciate being here today to talk about social determinants of health and thinking about that in terms of both our, our micro work and our direct service approaches, but then also what that looks like at the macro level and what is our policy response to that. So when we talk a lot about what opportunities people have to achieve health and particularly when we talk about health inequities uh, and a lot of those structural issues that are producing the disparities that we see. 
Uh, a lot of this is what resources do people have access to? Uh, as direct service providers, a lot of times we have our patient or our client in front of us, and we're addressing the issues that they're having on an individual basis. But what does that look like across all of your patients, across the community, across your state, and across our country? We see a lot of themes starting to play out uh, at the structural level. Again, this idea of our, our patients are, are doing what they can do within their individually controlled circumstances, but a lot of times when we talk about control and power and all of that that kind of comes into social determinants, how much control do our patients have um, on the conditions of the environment around them? Place matters. Community matters. So when we talk about you know, our, the services and the health care services that are required to make people uh, healthy where they live, work, and play, let's think about, well, where do they live, work, and play? And how healthy are our communities? And then what are the structural issues that produce those outcomes? Um, and so I just wanted to have a couple of slides here where we can kind of talk about some different social determinants in a way that contrasts this. And I think healthcare obviously is something that we're all focused on, uh, and we typically think about that in our communities. Is what's the direct medical care that I can provide to this patient? Uh, how am I coordinating this care across the emergency department, uh, across nursing homes or, or other care environments where our patients might be? How am I making sure that they're taking their prescriptions the way that they need to be, creating a care plan that meets their individual needs? Like all of these things are the types of things that I think we're well versed in. But when we think about uh, the fact that we still have 30 million people who are uninsured in this country, we have millions more who are underinsured or who can't afford the premium or the deductible or can't afford the prescription drugs that we're prescribing, like how is it that we're part of a policy response to make sure that we've got these upstream more macro level solutions, particularly for the problems that, that are doggedly entrenched for so many of our patients. And so thinking about how are we part of the conversation, not only just being aware of the policy issues that create the inequities that we see, but how are we as healthcare providers part of the conversation in what is the importance of health insurance for our patients and how does that help us connect them to more comprehensive care? How do we make sure that we have the providers in our community, particularly specialty care, to be able to meet the needs of those that we serve? Are we part of a dis bigger discussion about what new programs are in um, different communities to make sure that needs are being met? Medical respite care program, for example, if we're seeing a lot of problems with discharges from hospitals or longer lengths of stay in our hospital system because people have nowhere to go when they're eligible for discharge, how is it that we can be a part of saying, hey, this is something that our community needs? And so talking with our hospital administrators or even our mayors uh, or city council or county council members about outstanding needs. Um, for those of you who are working in states that have more limited insurance um, options for people who are homeless, um, how is it that we're talking to our Medicaid director or our governors or other policymakers to say, hey, this is what health insurance eligibility would mean for the patients that we serve, and connecting that to use of emergency rooms and hospitalizations, and thinking about what's the broader healthcare system look like to be able to better meet uh, the needs of all of the patients that we're serving. And in particular, for those who do have access to health insurance, um, for, the, uh, for this population, does it offer all of the services that are needed? And, and typically, we don't see pervasive access to dental care, for example. Uh, case management and housing supports are something that could be added in to, particularly into Medicaid programs, uh, as added benefits that give us a better ability to treat folk, uh, folks in a comprehensive way and cover some of those uh, case management like um, services that make our medical care work better. And so thinking about this in, in, in a, uh, a big picture versus a smaller picture. Uh, likewise, in housing, again, we're trying to figure out where's a place that I can safely get my client tonight? Uh, can we get them on the Section 8 waiting list? Are we able to maybe, if we know there's a problem with a neighbor or a landlord, maybe one of our case managers can, can mitigate that issue. But 
at the bigger level, we have eight and a half million people in this country who are spending more than 50% of their income on housing. We know that housing is increasingly unaffordable for more and more people. And we know that uh, we've got about three, there's 3.7 million evictions in 2017. So we know there's a pervasive issue with just affording uh, affordable housing and getting our clients access to something that they can live in that's safe and stable and high quality and accessible and yet still affordable. Uh, so how is it that we're talking with the decision makers in our community about housing, afford you know, uh, housing affordable trust funds or some other program that can figure out how do we get more money to build more affordable housing? Uh, if you've got regulatory barriers in your communities, and many of, many of our communities do, um, density um, uh, provisions or, or other things that make it harder to add um, mother-in-law suites, for example, or tiny houses, or some other kinds of housing uh, or affordable housing, sometimes those are the kinds of barriers that we need to really bring down. Uh, inclusionary zoning laws are very popular in making sure that when you've got new developments, that we are setting aside a percentage of those for people who are at very low income levels and thinking about what that looks like at a macro level. Um, I, I think just another piece to think about too is that among low income renters, 28% of people were unable to pay their full rent um, in, in uh, the third quarter last year. And so again, this is kind of thinking about this Lots of people are having these issues, but there are structural policies that, that keep our clients um, out of housing. So how are we part of those discussions? Um, talking about food, uh, we know uh, SNAP or a Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, or many of us know it as food stamps. Uh, so getting people into that program, connecting people to soup kitchens or food pantries, teaching healthy habits, like all the things we do around trying to get healthy food. But when we look at our communities, it may be that our clients don't have any access to supermarkets that have got fresh, wholesome food. Uh, sometimes we're calling these food deserts. I'm increasingly seeing the term food swamp, which means it's not that there isn't any food, but the food that is available is not at all nutritious. Uh, and in fact, that's what a, a, a majority of very low-income people are in neighborhoods where the only access to food is at the corner store where it's either prepackaged, high in fat, cholesterol, salts, and sugars, and we're not able to get people to the healthy food priority areas that they need. Um, thinking about what does the free breakfast and, and, and lunch program look like in your local school? Is that meeting the need? Is there some more that we can do there? Um, so uh, how are we getting access to farmers markets for a broader range of people? These are some of the policy solutions that can really address some of these social determinants of health when we talk about food and access. Um, want to talk a lot about um, some of the, the policies that are increasingly being talked about um, in our federal uh, discussion, but also at our state level, have the potential to really introduce some barriers to attaining some of the outcomes that we'd like to see. So example, more and more people are talking about work and work requirements, uh, particularly attached to food stamps, housing assistance, um, and health care. And so thinking about how are we having the discussion with our policymakers about what would that look like uh, for our population? How would that impact our health? What kind of impact do we see on health outcomes? So really just being a part of that discussion so that we know that policies and programs, when they are being created, are created with our clients in mind so that people can better understand the macro level, big picture impact on the people that we're trying to serve. Um, just want to, for a few minutes, just kind of hit a few more along this line. We talk a lot about the justice system as well and thinking about legal implications of being as a uh, social determinants of health. So we connect people to legal aid. We, if they have an expungible um, uh, piece on their on their on their record, can we help them get that expunged? Can we help them meet the parole and probation requirements? Uh, how do we get someone into a diversion program, perhaps if if that's available in your community? So again, that direct service work. Um, but how much of that is really available in our communities? How much of that um, expanding diversion programs? Uh, making sure that you're getting a full range of comprehensive care uh, when people are incarcerated and making sure that their, their treatment plan isn't disrupted. This is a really big continuity of care issue, but making sure that people can get care is really important. 
Um, just briefly on, on these other two, employment is getting a lot more discussion and the role of work, particularly attached to the benefits um, and services that people are eligible for, thinking about who qualifies, how do those um, policies impact the population we're seeing, how is it that we're increasing wages so that they can better align with the cost of housing, and thinking about what that looks like in our communities. Uh, do, pe or do people have transportation that allows them to get back and forth to work? Uh, again, all of these things are, are pieces of uh, social determinants of health at the macro level. And then finally, just again, just the thinking about uh, education. We all know how important that is to, to um, setting the stability for su uh, lifetime success. But who is eligible? How are our communities distributing resources? What do our K through 12 education systems look like really in investing in our kids, particularly in low income communities? Are they getting the curriculum and the skills that they need to be successful and set them up for longer term um, success? So whether that means vocational or trade school or higher ed, how is that ladder? So Darlene talked a little bit about that ladder that we have in our community. How are we making sure that the structures and policies that we have in place in our community are facilitating an upward um, bent to making sure that our clients can climb that ladder at an equitable ex um, rate as, ever, as, as their peers uh, in, in higher income groups? I think that's where we're trying to go is really making sure that we're working not just at that one-on-one -on -one service level, but participating in this bigger upstream picture of what social determinants of health mean in our policies and programs that govern the care that we're then providing for our clients. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to, to Darlene um, and really appreciate this being a part of this discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to share some of the resources that are um, that we have located that may be of help to you. Of course, again, these slides will be available um, uh, for you. And then also, here's our contact information. Um, and then I wanted to go to a Q and A. There's a uh, question here, Barbara, that I want to just ask uh, quickly from uh, Sam Shapiro. He asked, what precedents are there for safety net health care providers being able to advocate for policy change to increase housing availability and post-acute care placement options? We are San Francisco's public health hospital and are working to effect, effectuate this policy change, but would appreciate having others to look to and learn from as we develop and roll out our interventions. Do you have any quick um, promising practices to share or someone, and if not, we can always get take this offline and give him some resources? No, this is, this is a great question, and there are lots of examples of how healthcare providers are um, identifying health outcomes, uh, disparities, um, issues that are, you know, use your data that you have. San Francisco Public Health Department has tons of data, and you guys are really strong on your supportive housing work. So thinking about how do you, in, in the safety net program, talk with your um, city council or county council and all of the policymakers that are funding your housing and making sure that you're linking your data and your experiences and the stories of your patients and your providers to that conversation to be able to drive a, a further expansion of the housing opportunities there. I think we're seeing a lot of success with um, healthcare providers being very credible um, change makers uh, in that conversation. So I'd really encourage you to use the data and, and, and uh, work with the policymakers there. Great. Thank you, Barbara. And one of the resources um, I included was <clears throat> A case walk, uh, case study. I'm sorry, on um, building healthy places um, with Cincinnati Hospital, where they actually saw um, because so many children were coming into their ED with asthma, they traced it back, or they actually found that they lived in this housing project, and based on the findings of the conditions in the housing project, the hospital actually rebuilt. Um, housing for these children, and so there's a whole lot um, of information on that, and they work through their medical legal partnership at their hospital to do that. So there's also an example of a hospital who um, used data to drive um, some housing project. I know Janet Hayes has mentioned several different um, issues regarding severely um, or seriously mental ill 
um, people, and I know they have many challenges when it comes to um, medication management as well as housing. Um, so, Janet, we, we understand that we'll be talking a little more um, in the future webinars about trauma-informed care and harm reduction, and so I'm, I will, I'm sure we will capture this uh, population in those webinars. So um, thank you for your comments, and yes, we do um, recognize the needs of seriously mentally ill um, people, especially those, especially those who are experiencing homelessness. Um, we don't want to take any more time because I want to leave some time for our partners um, at Meharry. So I'm going to turn it over, I believe, to Dr. Morse at this time and let him share um, the information. And then we can always come back to questions if, the, if time allows. Thank you so much. Hi. Uh, the title of... Um the title of this presentation is Reducing Implicit Bias Towards Vulnerable Populations Among Healthcare Providers. And um, today, uh, my, my name is Matt Morris, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Meharry Medical College. Uh, and I will be uh, taking the first half of this presentation, and then my colleague, Dr. Armand Le Ramesh, who's uh, an associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Cancer Biology, uh, will, be, will be taking care of the second half of the presentation today. So what we hope to do uh, is to first provide um, an outline of provider bias and how this uh, is linked to health disparities in the three vulnerable populations that our center is focused on. Um, that is uh, LGBTQ patients, uh, migrant farm workers, and persons experiencing homelessness. Uh, next, we'll talk a little bit about what implicit bias is and contrast it with explicit bias. Uh, we'll talk about how it affects patients uh, and what is being done in medical schools uh, to address it. Uh, and then we'll go into um, uh, describing uh, the results of a systematic review that we conducted on bias reduction uh, in LGBTQ populations uh, and implications of that uh, for medical school training. Uh, so as I mentioned, the three vulnerable populations that we are focused on are LGBTQ individuals, migrant farm workers, and persons experiencing homelessness. Um, and although um, implicit biases among healthcare providers are likely to negatively impact all of these patient groups, uh, Dr. Ramesh and I will be focusing today um, uh, more so on implicit bias toward LGBTQ patients. And that is because, unfortunately, there's currently limited research on implicit provider biases towards persons experiencing homelessness. Um, and we think this represents a critical avenue for future research. Um, and we'll be talking about the biases towards that, uh, that population uh, whenever there is uh, uh, data available. Um, the health disparities that these populations experience may be due in part to uh, patients perceiving discrimination on the part of their health care providers um, and also to lower health care utilization, and those two are, are, are interconnected themes. And it's important to note here that um, uh, some of these health disparities are compounded by intersecting vulnerabilities. So, for example, LGBT, LGBTQ individuals who are also uh, currently experiencing homelessness. So what is implicit bias? Well, let me talk first of all about uh, what explicit bias is. So those are attitudes or prejudices towards groups that are consciously accessible, um, that is to say that we are aware of. And these explicit biases can be negative. And in the case of LGBTQ individuals, they may include overt homophobia. So these biases can be assessed through self-report measures, uh, such as by asking people uh, the extent to which they prefer one group over another. And they may be, unfortunately, influenced by social desirability. So implicit biases, by contrast, are outside of conscious control. And these are feelings and attitudes towards groups that we are not aware of. These biases are universal um, uh, and, interestingly, may not reflect our explicit attitudes. So what we say we believe may not necessarily coincide with our implicit biases. Now, these biases can be negative, and in the case of LGBTQ individuals, may lead to discriminatory behaviors. So how do we assess uh, implicit bias? Well, these biases can be assessed through response latency tests, such as the Implicit Association Test, or IAT, uh, which examines associations between group characteristics and values. So for example, do we make faster responses on a task categorizing heterosexual people with good words and LGBTQ people with bad words than on a task categorizing heterosexual people with bad words and LGBTQ people with good words? If so, our responses would be interpreted as revealing an implicit preference for heterosexual people compared to LGBTQ individuals. 
Um, it's important to note as well that implicit biases are resistant to change. So, for example, um, individuals who have biases towards LGBTQ individuals may avoid contact with that group due to discomfort, and that in turn could serve to maintain those implicit biases by preventing opportunities for intergroup contact and individuation, which are strategies that are uh, effective at handling uh, or at reducing implicit biases that uh, my colleague Dr. Ramesh will talk about uh, in a moment. So how common is implicit bias? Well, according to data from Project Implicit on uh, over uh, about a, one and a half million responses to the sexuality implicit association test, implicit preferences for straight people compared to gay people are the norm. Um, and you'll see here that about a quarter um, of those respondents exhibited uh, response profiles indicating strong automatic preferences for straight uh, compared to gay people. Moreover, a study conducted by Burke and colleagues using the sexuality implicit association test uh, with uh, straight first-year medical students found that about 80% exhibited implicit bias against gay and lesbian individuals. Um, and importantly, of those 80%, half of those reported no explicit bias against those individuals on self-report measures. In other words, uh, uh, according to their self-report, they did not have any biases, but when they completed the sexuality IAT, uh, implicit biases were noted. Now, much less work has been done uh, with uh, populations experiencing homelessness. There's a study uh, suggesting, uh, using the IAT, that non-providers exhibit, exhibit implicit bias towards persons experiencing homelessness. And there's other research uh, that suggests that um, uh, a number of healthcare access barriers uh, for people experiencing homelessness, uh, which include negative provider attitudes or behaviors, um, also lack of compassion, for example, and being made to wait longer than other patients. So what impact do implicit biases have on, uh, on patients? Well, according to work by uh, Zescott and colleagues, uh, implicit biases can impact medical judgments and treatment decisions. Uh, and this becomes especially problematic under situations when healthcare providers have limited time or experiencing fatigue. Um, implicit biases can also affect, negatively affect patient interactions uh, in ways that um, may produce frustration on the part of patients uh, feel, who feel like they're not being understood, um, may decrease patient engagement and adherence to treatment regimens, and may also reduce the likelihood uh, of follow-up care, and in so doing, uh, contribute to poor health outcomes. So how is implicit bias currently being addressed? Well. Um, Surveys of uh, healthcare providers suggest that more than half express discomfort caring for LGBTQ patients. Um, and surveys of uh, medical schools, uh, medical school deans, I should say, uh, indicate that a median of only about five hours is dedicated to LGBTQ-related contact with little to no emphasis on bias reduction strategies. Now, it's important to note um, uh, that there's very little uh, uh, that we are aware of that's done focusing specifically on populations experiencing homelessness. And with that, I will turn over to my colleague, Dr. Ramesh. Good morning. My name is uh, Ramesh. Uh, Dr. Morris has uh, given a uh, detail of uh, how the implicit bias exists among vulnerable populations. As he also mentioned, that uh, there is not much information available in the literature. The studies available are fragmentary. So what we did was to conduct a systemic, systematic review of uh, our literature uh, for bias reduction strategies. And uh, we did uh, follow a, using the PRISMA guidelines for surveying the literature. And we surveyed a wide variety of databases, which includes uh, PubMed, PsycInfo, Web of Science, Scopus, Syngenta, Science Direct, etc. And we used several keywords for the vulnerable populations, healthcare profession students, bias, and several of the key terms. The inclusion criteria we used were uh, using the dental, nursing, medical students, different training programs, culturally competent care for uh, vulnerable populations, and those publications uh, in English, and those studies published uh, prior to 2017. And uh, what we found out was our initial uh, screening revealed 353 abstracts in the initial database search. 
out of which 293 abstracts were excluded because some of them are duplicates, some are merely reviews, and some are editorials. And as a result, we screened 60 articles, and out of which 47 articles were excluded because there is no training component involved in it. And 13 articles we used for our uh, qualitative analysis, of which nine dealt with medical students and four dealt with uh, service providers. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we used a population of medical, nursing, and dental students, and we also included the healthcare providers. And the programs varied in their delivery format. Some contained lectures, some used small group discussions, some uses, used interactive workshops, and also they used the programs. All these programs varied in their uh, frequency and the duration of training. And the outcome measures what we used were whether the programs targeted knowledge, attitudes, and comfort level of students as well as care providers. And the tools used to increase uh, student or provider knowledge were lectures, readings, video showings, and uh, interviews by the affected uh, individuals from vulnerable populations and uh, group discussions. And uh, we based our assessment on a criteria such as uh, knowledge. Uh, before giving the survey, uh, we uh, surveyed for information on whether there is a pretest and what the pretest findings revealed. And the pretext findings revealed that there exist critical gaps in students' knowledge. And once the programs were implemented, there is a significant increase in knowledge base was found, both among the students as well as providers. And uh, as a result of the various uh, programs, uh, the reported results showed that uh, uh, it increased the knowledge as well as uh, retention. Even after uh, six months or one year after the programs were uh, given, uh, there is a significant knowledge retention happened. And when it came to the attitudes, whether these uh, training programs brought out any uh, comfortable change in attitudes of healthcare providers or uh, students towards these vulnerable populations, a vast majority of them showed positive, some others were uh, inconclusive. So the results were kind of uh, inconsistent. And uh, however, the comfort level was found to be increased and it also decreased anxiety among the students and providers while dealing with the uh, people from uh, vulnerable populations. And what kind of impact the, uh, the training will have on the medical schools? Uh, one thing is that they provide effective strategies and the information could be incorporated into the medical school curriculum. Even if there is information in the curriculum, the contact hours could be increased so that uh, more information could be delivered. And then um, uh, it also builds motivation for change because it provides increasing knowledge among both faculty and students uh, for the awareness of bias. And uh, the learning environment also could make use of the patient simulation labs. Uh, to take it to the next level. And uh, some other strategies such as perspective taking and intergroup contacts are uh, uh, expected to uh, minimize the impact of biases on uh, patient care. And uh, so, uh, as Dr. Morris mentioned earlier, there is literally limited information on uh, farm workers or patients experiencing uh, homelessness. Our expectation is we could use this construct uh, to target uh, uh, implicit bias and uh, avoiding it for the other uh, vulnerable populations such as the homeless and uh, farm workers. Currently, uh, we conducted a survey of the uh, medical schools. Uh, with regard to addressing uh, implicit bias and the uh, extent of hours uh, uh, put in curriculum and what kind of uh, teaching modes and strategies. It is an exhaustive, uh, exhaustive survey and we have received good responses. We are in the process of uh, 
analyzing the data and uh, once the data results uh, comes out uh, in one of the future webinars we will uh, share our uh, findings uh, how it affects not only the uh, gender minorities but uh, other vulnerable groups like uh, patients experiencing homelessness and uh, uh, farm workers as well and um, thank you very much for uh, listening to our uh, uh, webinars we would be glad to answer any questions that you may have thank you dr ramesh are there any um, we have a few minutes for questions um, at this time are there any questions and thank you janet for your comments and um, she was commenting on for the presenter she commented on the webinar so thank you so much for your kind response um, is there are there any questions that um, anyone has that they would like for the presenters to answer um, we have time to field some questions at this time I don't see any questions coming in um, for the presenters was there anything that you did not have um, time to say because you're trying to stay within a certain time limit that you would like to perhaps um, elaborate on or or just go back to reiterate or or cover I, I, we can open that um, we can open this time for that as well Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you have one question, Darlene. I don't see the question. It's from uh, Catherine Cavanaugh. The question was, how can we address um, implicit bias towards people experiencing homelessness? And as a follow-up, Amy Moore asked, would you send the link to take the implicit bias? Oh, I see it now. Okay, thank you. Dr. Moore, Dr. Ramesh, would you would any of you like to take this? How can we address uh, Catherine Cavanaugh, how can we address implicit bias towards people experiencing homelessness? Hi, this is this is Matt uh, back on the phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. So I think based on what we've learned from um, our review focusing on the LGBTQ individuals, uh, or patients, I should say, there's a number of strategies that might be important. Uh, the first is um, having medical students uh, become more aware of their implicit biases. So normalizing them to the fact that these biases exist for everyone, um, and having them conduct uh, tests such as the implicit association test, uh, perhaps focusing specifically on, um, on persons experiencing homelessness, uh, so that they can become more aware of uh, whether they have biases towards that population. And then I think a second strategy uh, would be to include, um, to involve perhaps um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness uh, 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 in uh, medical school training uh, to promote uh, kind of intergroup contact, which seemed to be another really effective strategy uh, for reducing bias um, and promoting individuation, that is to say, uh, taking into account individual characteristics rather than kind of lumping people into groups. Um, so based on what we found, I think those were those were some of the more effective uh, uh, strategies that could be addressed. And I think just one caveat with using the implicit association test, um, that would have to be kind of conducted in a very sort of sensitive um, uh, atmosphere uh, to make sure that, um, uh, that individuals felt comfortable or that students in that case felt comfortable kind of sharing findings with, with the groups that they were talking about them with. Okay, thank you, Dr. Moore. And do you have the link that we could um, share with them? Um, the link to take the implicit bias test that we can share, we can put it up. Oh, if, um, not, if not now, we can include it, and in, as we um, we can add it if we don't have it at um, at hand. Yeah, it's it. it's through the website Project Implicit, but I can um, I don't have access to that right now, but I can definitely send okay. that to you so that we can be distributed afterwards. Yes. Great, thank you so much. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. So, Amy, we'll we will get that to um, the link. Oh, there it is. Okay, thank you. And this is Barbara. I, I want to add into that discussion, too, because thinking about implicit bias, it may be that people are unaware of the structural barriers 
that may pro prevent um, different populations from accessing care or following through on directions that, that we're giving in a medical context. And uh, just kind of complementing that discussion on really addressing and being aware of implicit bias, but what's the structural context? People, once they realize the structural um, barriers that people face, I think it tends to open people's eyes to why is it that my patients are not able to get well? And again, that macro, micro, social determinants of health framework. I just want to link, link those two things together. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. So um, Amy has written a comment, there are several county agencies in Michigan that are passing health in all policies. Is this a recommended strategy? Are there others that we could support? Um, yes, this is a recommended strategy. I know um, the American Public Health Association uh, promotes the health in all policies um, outlook, and so they've done a lot of work in that in that area. Um, asking people to make sure that they put look at health and not just um, health as the health care and everything that they do. So, yes, it is a recommended strategy. Um, as I mentioned, the American Public Health Association, I don't know of any other um, county or agencies. Barbara, do you know of anyone else or anyone else on the uh, call know um, others that are doing the health and all policy work? APHA is the one I'm most familiar with. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Amy, for, for that, for sharing about the Michigan uh, County Agencies in Michigan. Appreciate that. Okay. I think that um, I don't see any more questions. Um, thank you all for um, presenting today. And we'd like to just um, remind you that this um, presentation is going to be archived on our website. That's NH. Uh, chc.org within three business days, and then also the link will be sent out to all registrants. So um, once it gets posted, we also send the link to the registrants, so you will get that um, for that. And also as we close out the webinar, we, there will be an evaluation for, the, um, for this presentation, so will you please um, complete that? This helps, you know, it gives us feedback so that we know how to improve your rep webinar experience. So um, with that, I'm going to um, thank once again our presenters. Thank you, Dr. Brown, Dr. DiPietro, Dr. Moore, Morris, as well as um, Dr. Ramesh for your time and the information. And uh, with that, the meeting is now closed. <laughs>